Table of contents! Let that sit up for a little bit. Let you peruse the details. Alright, let's go. Sometimes there are people who are just born different. Whether it be blatantly obvious, like in size or breathing fire, or in more subtle ways where just seeing the world differently can make all the difference. These are the sorts of characters that Mutants and Masterminds focuses on. Mutants and Masterminds, which I'll shorten to m and from now on, actually uses the open source D20 system originally put forward by 3.P, and used that basis to become its own thing entirely, at least in my opinion. The main gimmicks of the system are that its characters are a cut above the norm, and everyone is generally able to take massive blows but still stand up to fight, with a fairly generous combat health system, as well as a ridiculously open yet concise character creation process that lets you build just about any character imaginable, yet one that anyone else playing the game can quickly and easily understand. This guide is meant to run someone with a bit of experience with pen and paper games as to how they can make their own character in the system, and an understanding of its main conflict resolution rules, so you can make your own character quickly and get to playing. At certain points, though, I will refer to the Deluxe Heroes rulebook, since I am not going to waste anyone's time in listing out all the possible powers or abilities. Due to all of the crossover with other D20 systems, though, I am going to first take the time in explaining some of the nuances and differences between playing this and, say, playing Pathfinder, since there are lots of things from the latter that simply don't fly here. In general, it's also useful for context as to how the system actually works before we get into how to build characters or play it. We need to know what's actually important. The biggest difference is that rolling the die does not result in a simple pass or fail. Instead, there are degrees of success and failure which are counted in multiples of 5, starting from when you first beat the check. So say that the check is 10 to beat. On 11, you get 1 degree of success. On 15, you get 2 degrees of success, and so on. Some abilities will only activate certain effects if you have a large degree of success or failure. So if someone whacked you over the head with 30 beyond what was needed on the roll, your character is probably going to be unconscious, if not worse. This can all of course work in reverse with degrees of failure. With this understanding, a nat 20 does not guarantee success. Rather, it just gives you a degree of success for free. However, in combat, nat 20s still do guarantee an auto hit, and nat 1s are an auto miss. So whether or not you're trying to murderize someone can really change how the check functions. Another point of difference is that Eminem generalizes situational modifiers and bonuses, then trying to assign a value for everything. If the DM feels that a situation is in favor of whatever you're doing, you get plus 2. If everything possible in the whole history of the world is in your favor, you get a bonus of plus 5. Of course, that can work in reverse if there are problems and distractions going on around the check. Finally, another point of difference to be aware of is when players decide to help. It's no longer a riskless task where everyone can just roll against 10 and see what happens. Now, it counts to the total degrees of success or failure. If three or more people pass the help, then the main player gets plus 5. But if everyone is filling their roles, then the main player takes a penalty instead. Now, this gets more into how Eminem specifically functions when it comes to character creation, and it's the idea of power level. Vegeta, what does the scouter say about his power level? For 3.P players, you can think of this as a point by system gone absolutely insane. It's over 9,000! What 9,000? The DM tells everyone what the starting power level is for their characters, and each point of power level gives you 15 points to spread around skills, stats, and other abilities. So for a quick idea, power level 0 is a normal person. Power level 5 to 6 is about peak human ability, 8 to 10 is like a superhero, and 12 and beyond is when cosmic scale becomes a factor. However, there are implied limits to the power level so that you can't just dump all of your points into time travel and prevent the villains from ever being born, or something like that. These limits are as follows. The following score combinations can never be more than double the power level. Dodge and Tough, Parry and Tough, Fortitude and Will, Attack and Effect. If you have an ability that does not need a roll to hit, it cannot have a value greater than the power level. None of your skill rolls can ever be greater than 10 plus the power level, although that limit does not include situational modifiers. So, Keep these limits in mind before you run off to build a literal one-punch man, as the DM will have every right to say that your setup is illegal under the rules. Remember that each of these power points, which is 15 times your power level, can be spent accordingly. 
each stat costs 2 points to upgrade, and note that you are allowed to unspend stats and give yourselves negatives in exchange for more points. You can spend on a 1 to 1 basis to improve your defensive stats or to buy advantages, which are sort of like feats in this system. Skills are bought on a 1 to 2 basis, with 1 point getting you 2 skill ranks to spread around, so if you ever see an M&M character with an odd number of skills, they did something wrong. And of course, powers. But that gets really complicated, so I'll touch on those more later. The last thing to keep in mind about the system is that measurements are really important when it comes to actually, you know, defining what happens and whether a move is legal for you to do. All measurements can be found on page 11 of the rulebook, so use it whenever you would come into question about things such as ranges, speeds, or strength-related abilities. Keep in mind, similar to physics, not exactly, but distance equals time plus speed. For throwing distances, this equals your character's strength plus the mass of the object. Moving on! Basic stats. Everyone starts with zeros in everything. This is the baseline for your average human being, but you can change your stats around anywhere between negative 5 and 20. There is a reference table on page 55 if you're curious as to what your numbers would correlate to. Your character stats are refer to whatever is their innate ability, it's what they're born with and who they are or what they have become, and it adds directly to any roles related to these stats. They are as follows. Strength. This affects how much damage you do in melee, the athletic skill, and determines how much you can lift. Stamina determines your toughness and how much you can generally resist damage. It also helps fortitude, which is meant to resist health-based or biological effects, and also acts as a general defense modifier if nothing else would really apply, in a way being a jack of all defenses. Agility, this lets you dodge ranged attacks and other sorts of things that would be appropriate for, you know, to dodge with agility. It also improves your initiative score for starting combat first, acrobatics, stealth, and generally anything to do with coordination or quick movements if no other role would apply. Dexterity, this determines how well you can aim, pilot vehicles, and generally make precise or controlled movements when no other values can be used. Fighting, uniquely this has its own listing in the system. This is your character's experience of being in intense life or death situations, and determines your reflexes at attacking and parrying in close combat. Intellect, it's how smart you are, knowing things, how to use technology, apply medicine, stuff like that. Awareness also gets its own stat in this system, but beyond the perception skill, it also helps your mental defenses, intuition, and insight. Presence. This is basically charisma and affects all of the social skills of lying, talking, and intimidation. Your defensive stats are as follows. Toughness starts out directly equal to stamina and lets you resist outright damage and physical attacks. Parry starts directly equal to your fighting score and covers blocking attacks in close combat. Dodge starts with your agility and lets you avoid ranged attacks among other possible effects. Will begins from awareness and lets you resist mental attacks and generally hold your sanity together. Fortitude also begins from stamina but is about staying healthy from toxins and disease or resisting the elements. More about how healthy you are as a person than whether or not you can take a knife. Now at this point I want to point out that there is no health point system in the game. Instead, players resist damage as well as they can, with 4 degrees of failure knocking them out of a fight, as that is what you would need to gain the incapacitated condition. These degrees of failure can stack over the course of a fight and cannot normally be healed away. And no, you cannot have a power that says you are immune from being incapacitated. This system lets you almost make anything, it doesn't let you make a filthy cheater. Hero Points! This is a special resource that players get from the DM for good roleplay, and is a bonus for them in play. Each character starts out with one hero point every session by default, and you can earn more if you roleplay according to your character's complications or other character flaws. Everybody must have three complications, with one of them being the motivation as to why they are in the story at all to begin with. Keep in mind that you lose all of your hero points at the end of every session, so use them! Hero points can be used to modify current events to your advantage, for example noticing a convenient fire extinguisher next to you as you are fighting a fire-based enemy, gaining an advantage ability for the remainder of the scene, although you must still meet the requirements for the ability anyway, and cannot choose any fortune or luck-based abilities. Before you roll, little cheaters, roll twice and take the better result. If the second die is lower than 11, add 10 to it. You can ask the DM for a hint or clue about the current scene. You can spend the point immediately to try to counter an effect when it, use it, when it is used against you, basically a free defense roll. 
And finally, remove the dazed or fatigue or stun conditions, or turn the exhausted condition into fatigue. Kind of the only way you can really heal yourself in the game, sorta. Skills! You use these whenever you do something that isn't related to, well, violence, or a raw stat check. The full list of skills is on page 63 onward in the book. Keep in mind though that in the special case of social skills, you take a penalty of minus 5 if you don't share a language with the target, or they're too dumb to understand you, too dumb being minus 5 intelligence or lower. I won't list every skill here, but I do want to go over some of the more unusual use cases. Acrobatics. You can use this to reduce fall damage, and you can always roll it against a difficulty of 20 to stand up as a free action instead of a move action if you ever get knocked down. Athletics, this is to climb, swim, run, jump, etc. You can roll this against a DC of 15 to move one distance rank faster per degree of success. Close and ranged combat. You need to specify a style of combat each time you pick one of these, so run that by your DM as to what is allowed. Some people may allow blades, but others may want you to be more specific than that, like Claymore. Deception. This lets you send out secret messages or feint in combat against the target's deception or insight skill to give them the vulnerable debuff against you until their next turn. Expertise. This is just about knowing stuff, but you need to specify a field of knowledge each time you take it. Again, the DM has to decide on what is and isn't too broad. Insight. You can use this to disbelieve illusions. Intimidate. You can make an intimidate roll as a standard action to impair or even disable your opponent until the end of your turn. Investigate. You can use this to surveillance an area and try to snuff out enemy stealth rolls. Sleight of hand. Also lets you pull escape artist work like getting out of traps or contorting your body. Technology. This is super general and kind of unique to the system, but it covers everything from like making things, fixing them, how explosives work, disabling security, and so on. Treatment. This is basically the medical skill. Vehicles. You need to specify a type of vehicle that you are good with. Most DMs will probably agree that airplanes are very different from cars and you need a separate skill for each of those. Advantages. These are little bonuses and extras for your character. Things like having equipment, money, extra little twists in combat, and other such things. Think of advantages as being like feats from other D20 systems. If you want a list of advantages, they're listed on page 80 to 81 and described in even more detail for the whole of that chapter. Powers! This is the bread and butter of the system, and sadly where this video guide is going to fall short. The thing is, powers are described with incredible vagueness. The system does this deliberately because it lets players describe or make up just about anything, as long as the end result is more or less the same as what the power describes. So for example, everything from fire blasts, ice bolts, shooting people super duper goodly, missile barrages, and even the kamehameha would all be neatly tucked away under the damage power. They all have the end result of making someone not feel so good. However, it is on the DM to tell you what you can't have and why, as some abilities are clearly ridiculous in comparison to others, looking at you time travel, immortality, and quickness. Or that weird King Crimson combination with Subtle and Insidious. Powers are listed on page 94 to 95 in detail further on in the chapter. Again, these powers only refer to the end result, and it is on the player to describe how the power actually works, so long as it is consistent with the rest of the system. Bear in mind that most powers require some sort of action cost, like move or standard, and they last for some period of time, and probably cause a target or other entity to roll in reaction to that power, probably to resist you, you know, trying to use it. A big problem that people often forget is that by default, your powers are inherently noticeable in some way, even if your character is turning invisible. In that case, if someone is staring at you directly, maybe there's a weird transparency or blur effect as you disappear. Whatever the case or how you describe it, there's a good chance that they will at least understand what's going on. Likewise, understand that if you are shooting beams of light, they'll see a flash and know it's from you specifically. There are add-ons to powers that can let you be sneakier, but without it, yeah, everyone knows that you're a superhero and that you're using your powers. Another inherent thing about powers are inherent qualities or descriptions. For example, if you want a fire blast, you can light things on fire with it. That is A-OK -okay and doesn't require any extra points to spend on it. If you want divine sources of abilities or for something to be radioactive, again, all cool. However, 
the effect cannot come into play against entities that can readily deal with such small complications. Now, what does that mean? If you're lighting things on fire, it's small flames that someone with two seconds can, you know, swat away. They'll be fine. Your divine power will not explode the heads of evil people, and the radiation you throw off may only just be enough to detect or shorten someone's life by, like, a day. Or if they have some sort of layer of material, then it'll completely stop it. The qualities of your powers are minor. They won't necessarily help you in a fight against a reasonable creature, but you can get very creative with them and invoke those qualities against objects, helpless people, or a number of other ways which the quality can start to run amok since no one's quickly dealing with it. If you want to start infernos with a shot of fire, that'll cost you some more points. Speaking of which, the point cost of a power is the base value plus extras minus flaws, and all of that is multiplied by the rank of the power. Finally, plus any flat modifiers. Keep in mind there is a limit to this equation. You can never set the value to less than one-fifth. You can't just stack a ridiculous amount of flaws so you can one-shot people on the cheap. Likewise, you must spend at least one point to gain access to a power. You cannot gain access to powers for free, or somehow split up a point to get a bunch of powers at a discount. And just to clarify this again, yes, you can get up to five ranks of a power for just one point depending on how you build it, but no more than that. Now, to explain what each of these words mean. Extras. These are things which improve your power further, like extra effects or having a quicker action cost, longer range or durations. A list of extras can be found on page 137, and they are described in more detail on page 136 onwards. Flaws. These are the opposite of extras, and they basically nerf your power by worsening the aforementioned values, or making your powers limited to very specific situations, like being underwater or being the last person standing in an encounter. Flaws are listed on page 147, but are described on detail on page 145 onwards. Before moving on, there is one extra that needs a little bit more explanation. It's called Alternate Effect. This extra lets you swap out the functions of an ability. The book often compares this to a laser gun being set on stun rather than kill, as one possible use of the extra. Note that the alternate effects cannot exceed the original rank or cost of the power, and you can't do this weird thing that people apparently tried of invoking alternate effect to then invoke more alternate effects. I don't even know how that would work honestly, or why you would even want to do that, but yeah. You can only invoke alternate effect once on the power you are currently using. So talk to your DM regarding this power because it can get pretty wonky. And that's about it regarding the powers. Final note is to try to keep your powers to whatever character theme you started out with, even if by the rules as written you can do a whole slew of things. DMs probably will not like it if you stretch your character out way beyond what was originally discussed. Equipment! If you want your character to be a mad genius scientist, or a walking arsenal of death with a slick motorcycle, or maybe the team just needs a hall of justice, that's all under equipment. Obviously, it is implied that your character needs to have the equipment advantage to be able to use any of this section. Because most equipment can be broken, stolen, and generally leave your site to do bad things, they gain powers and abilities at the minimum one-fifth. The thing is that when you get the equipment advantage, you gain five equipment points. You can use these points whenever you deal with equipment and can spend them like you would just to build a power or a character. But it's for an item. Also, this is where the rules can get a little controversial. It is not clarified whether these equipment points can be further discounted. So while your hero can get five ranks per one power point, you theoretically can also apply weaknesses and such to equipment, getting the equivalent of like 40 ranks per power point. If you really want to go full rules lawyer, Power Gamer MLG Demon, technically the one-fifth rule only applies to power points, not equipment points. So you could go insane with how far you stretch that. But if you are a sane DM or don't want to be a blight on the community, just limit equipment points to one-tenth or make a judgment call whenever people start stretching the points that way. Players, please talk to your DM about what's allowed with equipment points. And some final limits to equipment is that you cannot use the extra effort action, which I'll explain later in conjunction with equipment. It's just a mindless item, it does not know how to try harder, it doesn't even know that you're talking to it. 
And bonuses gained from equipment do not stack with other bonuses, so you can't say combine your plus 5 attack power with a plus 5 sword to get plus 10 to hit, that's just not how it works. A list of example melee weapons can be found on page 165, ranged on 167, explosives on 168, and armors on page 169. Talk to your DM if you want to make your own kinds of items though. While technically not equipment from a strict definition of the system, you can make your own powers into items called devices, and I'm going to cover that here. By default, a device has the removable flaw. Again, anyone can take or use these things, and that's kind of the point of that flaw. Although, because they're more than normal, and it would absolutely suck to just basically be robbed out of your XP, you do somehow get your devices back at the end of every scene. Maybe the stolen one breaks and you build a new one, stumble upon it in a park, whatever. This is the main bonus you get for having a device than rather trying to go super cheap with equipment. You can basically lose XP by having the latter one stolen or broken. If for some reason you need to make a device during play, you can also do that too. First, each device needs to be designed. This takes one hour per power point cost of the device and you ignore the removable flaw during this equation and the check you need to beat is 10 plus your power points. Then you actually need to build it, which takes 4 hours per power point and has the same check as the previous step. You can take minus 5 to any of these checks to reduce the time it takes by one rank. If you want to do a magic ritual variant, then the design portion is what takes 4 hours per point, and the actual performance of the ritual takes only 10 minutes per point. The skills involved are usually technology or expertise magic, or whatever else is appropriate. Once the device or ritual is completed, you can then spend the power points as needed, again so that you just don't actually waste XP. Finally, you can jury rig these things if you're in the heat of battle or at a deadline. It shortens all the way to one round per power point, but the DC becomes 15 plus the number of power points, and the effect or items are destroyed at the end of the encounter. You also cannot take the minus 5 time bonus when jury rigging, you're already working as fast as possible. Vehicles, cause we all want a Batmobile. These are bought with equipment points, but get statted as their own entity, and they have the following stats. Size, which determines a base value for strength, tough, and defense. Strength determines the carry and capacity. Speed sets, well, the speed of the vehicle. Toughness for the vehicle is what it rolls when it would take damage, which is kind of weird to think about, like a living car. Defense acts as the flat armor of the vehicle and how hard it is to hit in the first place. And finally, vehicles can also have powers and features, with features in this case being extra little things like lucky fuzzy dice or oil slick. With the exception of powers, all of these things I just listed cost a 1 to 1 ratio of equipment points to rank or thing you want associated with that rank. If you want an idea of the sizes, there is a chart on page 170. Keep in mind, players, that you are allowed to pull points together to buy a group car, and you can also get extra vehicles with the alternate equipment extra, with each vehicle costing just one more equipment point, but none of them being more powerful than the most expensive vehicle one before that. So if you already have the Batmobile, Robin's little cycle is just a drop in the bucket. Likewise, your characters can do the same thing with their headquarters, whether it is a grand hall or a humble little apartment. Unlike vehicles, HQs only have 3-4 to four stats, size, toughness, and features and maybe even powers. The book doesn't actually say that HQs can have powers, but I feel like maybe that was intended. Eh, your DM may disagree with me. HQ size starts out as small, and costs 1 point per size value. You can have negative sizes, but that then turns the process over to your DM to decide what is and isn't reasonable for you to have or do with that. Toughness starts at 6 and costs 1 equipment point per 2 points of toughness. Buildings are just freaking hard in the first place. And features cost 1 point per, but they're a little bit more unique here since features are implied to be like the rooms, special equipment, or other things that come with a property. An example list is on page 174 to 178. MINIONS! You get these little guys as part of the minions effect advantage, or through the summon power. They also get called constructs by the rulebook, or at least in the majority of the section that they actually showed up in, but they're called minions everywhere else, it's weird. Regardless, you build them like a player character and they are subject to the same limits, but they don't have the same starting values. By default, they must have no stamina score. 
like, at all. It just doesn't even apply. And the player chooses whether or not they have no intelligence and presence, or no strength and agility. Although that means constructs always have awareness, fighting, and dexterity? Eh, whatever. A benefit they do get in exchange, though, for all of that is that they start out as being completely immune to fortitude-based attacks. Another sort of issue that they have, though, for having no stamina, is that constructs must be repaired and they don't heal naturally. Any damage that they take does stick with them. Although you can give them the regeneration power and they'll just auto-repair or something. If you want to give a minion a stat that it doesn't normally have by default, you spend a point as normal and now they have the stat. But it starts at minus 5 instead of 0 like a normal player. Finally, if you ever want to boss your minions around, it costs a move action. When you do give an order and say just, you know, walk away or something like that, the minions will follow whatever was the last thing you said to the best of their abilities. So do not walk away from your minions. The DM will, and probably should, interpret your words as horribly as possible. And that's about it with minions. Like everything else, you can describe them however you want if it's reasonable, whether they're zombies, demons, kidnapped pizza delivery kids, you know, the usual. Finally, to tie it all together, combat! In combat, everyone gets one standard and one movement action, along with free actions and reactions that can be limited by the DM if they feel it is appropriate to. With this system, conditions and debuffs are what actually drive the flow of combat. You can find a list of them on page 17 to 19 of the core rulebook, but keep in mind that the fatigue condition becomes exhausted, and exhausted becomes incapacitated. At the start of every combat, characters roll for initiative, which is 1d20, plus the initiative bonus, plus any other applicable bon bonuses. Attacks are done with 1d20 plus bonuses, from say, powers, equipments, advantages, or other situational stuff, versus the enemy's defensive stat. This can all be done as a roll counter to your own, or if the group feels like that's too much dice flying around, just a flat 10 plus defense will do just fine. You can use parry to defend against close combat, or dodge against ranged. Fortitude and will will apply in their appropriate situations. If you roll a nat 20, you get 1. Only one of the following. You can increase the degree of success by one. Basically count your roll as if you rolled five more. Make it plus five harder to resist your effects, and this could potentially make your attacks last a lot longer if your opponents cannot roll out of whatever you're doing. If this is used on a minion enemy, this automatically maximizes whatever debuffs you're trying to throw at them according to what your power can actually do. You can add a completely new effect that has a DC of 10 to resist. You can get pretty descriptive with this, for example saying that your fire blast blinded someone with its bright light. Or finally, just an automatic hit. Natural ones cause an automatic miss. If you would ever take damage from something, you roll toughness against the damage plus 15. One degree of failure causes you to take minus one to all further toughness checks, and this condition stacks throughout combat. The idea is that you keep stacking this on somebody, and eventually they will start to go down. Two degrees of failure also invokes the minus one to toughness, as well as giving you the dazed condition. Three degrees of failure makes you staggered, and if you would ever hit this value for a second time when you're already staggered, you go straight to four. And four degrees of failure means you're an incapacitated. That's right, you're out of the fight. Items usually have no stamina or actions, so players can always choose to take a 10 on attacking objects at any time to hit them automatically. If you choose to roll, then it's an auto-critical so long as you don't roll a nat 1. The thing is, the item rolls too. Though the DM can just say it takes a 10 on its resistance roll, on 2 degrees of failure the item can be bended or broken, or experience some other manipulation. 3 failures and the item is completely destroyed with beyond possible use. Range Bands! Close range is within 5 feet. Short is the rank of the ability times 25 feet. Medium range is the ability rank times 50 feet, but you also take a minus 2 penalty for hitting at this range. Long range is times 50 feet with a minus 5 penalty. And finally, there's Perception Range. Attacks that use Perception Range or target an entire area do not roll to hit, but they also cannot be modified further by maneuvers or criticals. You may be able to use hero points, heroic effort, situations, or perhaps even equipment if the DM allows, however. Concealment is how well the target can perceive you. If they can only make out part of you, they take minus two to hit. If you are totally hidden and they're basically just guessing, minus five if they're at least aiming in the right direction. 
Likewise, being behind cover works the same way. Minus 2 for partial, minus 5 for total. EXTRA EFFORT! This is an action that players can take at any time to gain one of the following. An extra standard action, modify as an existing bonus or penalty to the nearest value, so say 5, 2, or 0. Use an alternate power effect, basically change how your power works for just a moment. Get an extra roll against an effect, but if you are being mind controlled, you cannot use this as an excuse to like, knock yourself unconscious or something. You can use it to retry a power if applicable, or finally increase your speed or strength rank by 1 until the next turn. Keep in mind though that using extra effort will give you the fatigue condition, then exhausted, and finally incapacitated, so be careful when pushing yourself to the limits. Another cool action characters can do is to preemptively counter each other's powers. State who and what you're trying to counter, and when it happens you roll your own power against theirs. If you succeed, you completely stop them from using their abilities. Of course, you need to make up a cool description as to how you pull this off, otherwise it just won't make sense. Like, there's a problem in doing that here. Then there's a bunch more stuff I'm just gonna rapid fire out here. Ready? Go! Aid Another is an action where you roll against a DC of 10 to try to give plus 2 to the ally's next attack. They gain plus 5 if you beat the check by 3 degrees of success, or, you know, in total with other people helping you out. Aim is the action that makes yourself vulnerable for a little bit, which means that your defenses are halved, but you gain plus 2 on your next ranged attack, or plus 5 if the target is close to you. Aim is lost if your next action is anything but attacking, however. CHARGE! Move an attack with minus 2 to hit as a standard action. Yes, this means that doing a charge actually lets you move a second time during the round. Command. This is a move action to order somebody to do something, usually an NPC or minion. Defend. Roll one of your defenses against an attack made against you. Then you add 10 if your roll was 11 or less. This is basically dedicating your standard action to full defense for a round. Delay your turn. Be careful of doing this though since it causes you to immediately lose all of your buffs. But any debuffs will stay as normal. Disarm and trip. Roll to attack with minus 2 or minus 5 if you're using a ranged attack for an enemy to lose an item or fall prone respectively. The opponent responds with a strength or acrobatics roll respectively to stop this from happening, although if you lose the roll, then they get a chance to do the same thing back to you. Note, this cannot cause an endless chain of people trying to trip each other, the chain ends on the opponent's reaction. And one more thing, trips cannot be ranged, so that little minus 5 thing doesn't actually apply to them since it can't happen. Dropping items, or yourself, to the floor is a free action. You can take an action to free yourself from a grab by rolling acrobatics or athletics to succeed. On success, you move your speed minus one away from the grabber. Speaking of grabs, GRABS! This is an attack check using your strength against the enemy strength or dodge roll. One success makes them vulnerable and immobile. Two successes and they are defenseless, you just need a DC of 10 to beat them. Immobile and impaired as you have successfully pinned them in place. However, during a grab, you yourself gain the hindered and vulnerable conditions, nor can you take any significant action with the limbs that you are using to grab the person with. You can always try to improve the grab on later turns, since the successes will stack over time, but the target has a chance to be freed if you ever fail these rolls. Maintaining the grab is a free action, thankfully. You can deal your strength score as damage to a target with a standard action, and move with a target as using an opposed strength check. Although if you fail this movement, then you are immobilized for the rest of the turn. Recover! Once per fight, you can remove the highest damage or fatigue from the character, and gain plus 2 to your defenses during the turn that you are recovering. Smash! Attack an item that the opponent is currently using, but you take minus 5 to hit the thing. Stand! Takes a move action to get up from the ground, or you can pass an acrobatics check against a DC of 20 to do it for free. It is assumed on a failure, however, that if you tried to do the acrobatics thing, you just wasted your move action. Finally, maneuvers. These are basically different ways to perform actions for different bonuses and penalties. Keep in mind that you can't reduce bonuses below zero or increase them by more than double, if that would somehow occur. You can also list by just how much of a bonus or penalty you want, as long as they are equal, but for the purpose of this guide I will use the maximum values of chains that you can invoke with these maneuvers. Most maneuvers are intended for attacks, but they, hey, you can get creative with these tags if they can be applied to other things. Accurate. You take minus 2 to the effect, but gain plus 2 to hit. All out. Plus 2 to your effect, but minus 2 to your defenses for the turn. Defensive. Minus 2 to hit, but gain plus 2 to your defenses. No, you cannot stack this with the defense action. 
Finishing Blow. If an enemy is defenseless, auto-hit them or roll an auto-crit on a success. Power. Minus 2 to hit, but gain plus 2 to the effect. Team Up! Everyone must delay to the same turn, and all attacks must be within 5 ranks of each other, and they must be resisted by the same check. All characters then roll to hit and add all of the successes directly to the damage that must be resisted. Slam Attack. You use your speed rank as damage, or damage plus 1, whichever is better. If moving at your full speed, you can gain plus 2 damage instead. However, you must roll toughness against half the damage that you just dealt, and on a failure, you take that damage too in a brutal wipeout. Once all of the dust has settled, everyone heals off one damage condition per minute, starting from the worst to the least. And with that, you're now ready to join the world of mutants and masterminds. Have a good one.